Ted Oakley is back. He is the founder of Oxbow Advisors, and we'll be picking his brain on exactly how to invest, not just what to invest, but how to invest. Ted, welcome back to the show. You bet, David. Glad to be here. Glad to host you as always. We've uh, picked your brain plenty of times over the course of the last year, so thank you very much for your contributions to Kitco. Uh, today's discussion, I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, obviously, we'll get your macro outlook, uh, but uh, equally importantly, we want to ask you, like my opening suggests, exactly how you pick your investments and your lead up to the, the investments that you would uh, recommend to your clients and perhaps share with our audience. So uh, before we do that, let's give a macro overview for our audience, a uh, big picture macro overview. Over the last year and a half, uh, last year and two months really, we've seen the stock markets correct the S&P by almost 20% in 2022. Now more recently, we've seen a rebound in almost all asset classes, including gold, including safe haven assets with the DXY falling and yields tapering off a little bit. Is this the beginning of a rebound, Ted? Well, I think, David, uh, it'd be hard to say right now. I, I, I know that things have moved higher, but if you look at it, and I think people always take it out of context. I'll take the S&P 500. Let's say it's up, you know, 4.8%, maybe 5% for the year. It's actually a little bit below where it was the very first part of December, uh, but in, since you started from a lower level after the sell-off in December, you know, December at the end of the year, people get the idea that we're in a big rally. Okay, well, we've rallied. There's no question about that. But all of a sudden, if you'll notice, we're moving back into the fangs, the mems, all these things that didn't make any sense in the beginning, uh, Bitcoin. And so we're back in that zone, so to speak. We have all these people buying these options that just, you know, that go away in one day, that sort of thing. So the speculative fever is pushed back into it. I would have to say that at best, you'll have a series of ups and downs. You know, maybe you get a, a rally market up, then you get a market that goes down. Uh, but I would say in the long run, I think you'll still go to at least somewhat of a new low before it's all said and done. Are you basing this off of mean reversion or fundamentals? Off fundamentals, yeah. We we you know if you look at the S and P today at four thousand, and you know the street has a two twenty five, two twenty three uh, ex est estimate for earnings. We think we think they're like thirty dollars, twenty five or thirty bucks over where it's going to actually come in when it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. So even even at two hundred, if you think about it, that's a twenty multiple on forward earnings. Way too expensive. Okay, it's, that's not a cheap market under any circumstance. And so it sets you up to where if you want to go back to a cheap market with uh, say a, a 195 or a 200 uh, earnings uh, handle on it, you're going to end up back in the low 3000s if you're going to be inexpensive. Now, if you want to stay expensive and people just pay for it no matter what, that's their business. But that's not something we would do. Okay. I think investors watching the show right now would like to learn from you uh, in regards to asset protection and wealth protection during bear markets. Uh, you've been around and you've invested in the markets for a long, long time. Let's start by examining some of the more prominent bear markets uh, in the last 40 years. Where were you during 1987, October 1987? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I did a study. The markets were up uh, by by August of 1987. The markets were up really high. They'd gone up something like 30 over 30% for the year already. And we actually went back and did a study and, and looked, I said, well, I want to find out if markets are up 25% in the first six months of the year, what are the odds that we close higher than that at the end of the year? And we did that study and finally it was, it was minuscule. So we raised about, uh, we had about 40% cash or higher and we ended up with a pretty good year uh, because two days after, uh, like on October 21st, uh, we were in there buying stock, you know, really both hands. And we ended up with a good 87 and a good 88. Wow. Okay. Did you see the signs coming? Well, I saw it then. Yeah. You, you can see the signs. I mean, you, you, the problem is, you know, it can go longer than you think. And I think that's what messes people up. They, uh, they know things are out of line, but they just go with it and they think, well, it hasn't happened yet, so maybe it's not going to happen, but it never it never works out that way. Uh, the current bear market that we've seen in the last, I guess, year and perhaps that we're still in, 
Uh, what is it closest to if you compare to historical bear markets? 2008, 2001, 1987, 70s. What are we looking at? You know, uh, you know David, I think it compares most to uh, the tech bust. Okay. In many, in many ways, I think it could be a you know first of all, it's already been a, a going on a 13 month bear if you take it from the high. And what happened during that time, and I think this frustrated a lot of people, was we had many bear market rallies. And I mean, I'm, some of them were like 15%, 18%, and but you kept on going to just minor new lows, minor new lows, until you got to the end, until you got to uh, you know October of 2002, which was basically three years later. You had a big washout in October of 2002. It wasn't the low, but you could have bought it there and been just fine. And then you ended up, as soon as the war was announced in 2003, uh, and everybody thought, you know, you know, as soon as they start fighting, we're over. And as soon as it got announced, that was uh, March of 03, and the market took off. And that was, actually, that was one of our biggest years. Um, the tech bubble frustrated a lot of investors because there was so much hope for what would become the tech sector of today. Of course, most internet companies back then went bust. I think we're seeing a parallel with perhaps the crypto industry, not necessarily uh, the not necessarily a par direct parallel with tech companies, but we're seeing a lot of crypto companies go to zero, a lot of crypto projects go to zero. Uh, tech companies overall are still holding steady. We've seen tech layoffs in Silicon Valley, but you know Google's not collapsing, Facebook's not collapsing, Microsoft's still doing all right despite their despite the layoffs. Ted. Um, this time around, what indicators may show you that this time may be better or worse than 2001? Well, I think in most cases it would be worse. And this is why, Instead, you know, in the, in the tech break, it was mostly in tech. At that time, uh, 98, 99, 2001, you could buy a lot of great value stocks and you had interest rates were higher and you could get some money while you waited. But value had never made a run at that time. This market that we finished in 2021, David, everything ran, everything. It didn't make a difference what it was. And so they were all expensive. But on top of that, instead of just having one area like tech that was really exploited or too expensive, we had all of these other areas. We had SPACs, we had crypto, we had NFTs, we had all these zombie companies. There's so many companies today that, that don't make any revenues or any money. We have more of those today than we ever had back then. And all of that is breaking down now. It's not finished in our opinion, but that's the difference between now and 2000. Some investors might push back on that and say, well, maybe they're not making money or perhaps having, perhaps they have negative earnings, but that's just the nature of that particular sector. I'm not saying all tech stocks are negative earning companies or perhaps zombie companies. But if you look at the sector overall, higher PE, higher uh, valuation based on a lot of other metrics, you can't really compare that using the same traditional valuation metrics as you would say a Johnson & Johnson, right? Well, that's true. I mean, you, when you look at companies like J&J, &J those, those are kind of, com those are tried and true, you know, over time. But the difference is, I think, and people have to realize this, you can only go so long with no cash flow. I mean, it, you, you can talk about it and everybody, we got in a mode there for about three or four years where everybody was like, don't worry about the future. You know, we're not making money now. We probably won't make any money in the next four or five years, but you know what? We've got this great product. If you really stop and think about that, that's a meaningless sentence because you don't have any revenues and you don't have any cash flow. And what makes every single business go, not just stocks, but every business is cash flow, real estate, private business, oil and gas, and these companies have no cash flow. So, you know, that ends up in the long run, people finally step back and say, well, gosh, we're not making any money. <laughs> and they sell it. And that's usually what happens. Okay. So generally avoid companies that don't make any money. I mean, that does sound like common sense, Ted, yet people still do it. Why? Well, I think what's happened is we grew up with a group of investors now, say under 40, that, that really grew up on games and internet and phones and all everything else. And everything became sort of a game, you know, it, and they didn't realize that, you know, if you're gonna have a sustained long-term company, okay, 
it's going to have to be cash flow positive. It's going to have to be able to reinvest back in its products, that sort of thing. But what happened is they, they grew up on that sort of thing, and so they bought into it. I think they're also coming around now to realize that, hey, this might not work necessarily because I'm losing a lot of money on a lot of these things. And that's I think that's where a lot of them are today. Straight out of school, I uh, applied for a number of firms, one of them being a hedge fund, and uh, I, I didn't get the job, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing today. But uh, uh, they, they asked me, one of the interviewer asked me this technical question. He said, I'm going to give you three statements, just the three statements, not the notes, not the MDMA, uh, just uh, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. What are the top three financial metrics you would look at before deciding to look even further at the company? And I'll extend the same question to you. Well, obviously, we look at free cash flow. Okay. I mean, free cash flow is what's going to make a company go. And there's some great tech. By, by the way, there's some great tech companies that have great free cash flows. I'm not. I'm not ruling that out because a lot of the newer companies that are large now, you know, they operate on. They don't have to have a lot of capital expenditures, and and it's really, you know, it's really a good setup for them. I think you have to look at that. Secondly, you've got you have to look at debt. I mean, you know, and what kind of debt. Okay, is it fixed? Is it floating? Uh, debt usually is what will kill a private company. It will pill, kill an individual. Debt will always murder you in the end if you have too much of it, and you have to be able to catch, you know, catch the debt. And then the last thing is you have to see relative to those cash flows. Okay, if you do a present value of those, you have to try to look at that and say, you know. Where I am I with that relative to, am I at the really top end of that range? Because if I am, I think I'm going to wait a little while. Maybe a great company, but you can wait on it a little while and, and go with that. And, you know, those are things we look at. Um, we like to have companies that give money back to the shareholders as opposed to just buying their shares all the time, because that does nothing mainly but enhance management. But um, we look at all those things, really. Interesting. Um, doesn't debt make a company grow faster though, Ted? It does if it's managed, David. It has to be managed. One of the things you find is that debt is really okay. If you can put debt on and then whatever business you're working in, that business or even another business, and you get a net return, that's okay. But you, get, you have to make that work. And you can see it, you know, one of the greatest places to see it is in real estate. You put debt on real estate, your cash flow covers it, you've got a cash flow overage, and that way you have an asset that can grow over time. If you put debt on, though, and it's at the wrong level, I'm talking about the interest rate level, and then all of a sudden whatever you're investing in or whatever you're earning goes below that level, then you're, then you're in trouble because you're going backwards all the while. You're spending more money than you're actually making, and that, that doesn't work. I saw somewhere on Twitter, somebody tweeted, Google's cost savings from laying off 12,000 workers is $2.5 billion. Uh, the amount they spent on shared buyback last year, $57 billion. Um, look, they're smarter than me. Clearly, they're doing something I'm not thinking about. I mean, how would you respond to that kind of corporate strategy? You know, David, I, I know uh, people will probably find this a bit controversial, but I do think I think if we had no buybacks in the United States, we would be better off. We would require these companies to have to go out and get business, build business, and it wouldn't be this game of buying back stock and issuing management stock to all of upper management. And you know, you look at all these managements, they get paid, let's say they get paid a million and a half bucks, but you look to the right hand side of that proxy and they're getting another 15, 18, 20 million in stock. Really, it's actually a rip off to the average shareholder. And personally, I, you know, if we did, I know that I could say, yeah, maybe there are some cases you could have buybacks if it's really dirt cheap. But by and large, it's become a racket the last 30 years. And I think we'd be better off if we had a lot less of it personally. Interesting. Um, when you look at a company, uh, especially the smaller companies, you know, a lot of them, I speak to a lot of junior and minor investors, for example, and what I hear from a lot of these investors is that they look for the management team probably more so than they look for the deposits themselves. Um, 
you know, this is obviously it comes from experience, but when you're looking at a management team, a corporate board, what are some of the signs that you look for that may indicate to you that this company may be successful or may flop? Well, the number one thing we would like to have, and I, I will tell you this is hard to find, especially in really larger companies, but one of the things we would love to find is an original founder as the chairman of the board or something, or chairwoman of the board. That's interesting. That would be something we'd love to find because we know how they had, what they had to go through to build a company. And that always helps you quite a bit. The second thing we look for is we like to see people that, you know, so many of the people that end up in the, in the present CEO suite, they came in because they were a CFO on from coming from the accounting side and they were with them all the time. So they got handpicked like that. And I'm giving you personal opinion here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see more. I love to see more management where they came up through the operating side. And then when they did that, they were able to understand, now you can learn the numbers, but you need to understand the operating side. And so we love to find managements where they've got, they're pretty adept in the operating side. Speaking of the human side of things, no doubt you've read news of open AI's chat GBT. It's taken the world by storm. Microsoft is looking into a multi-year and multi-billion dollar deal uh, with OpenAI, not yet closed, but they're working on it. Now, <laughs> Google is panicking. Everyone that has <laughs> white collar jobs kind of panicking. It passed a medical exam. It passed a Wharton MBA exam. It's only a matter of time before it does my job. Now, let's say, let's say Ted, somebody says to you, Ted, I think in 20 years, artificial intelligence could be an asset management, a manager. What would you say? How would you convince that investor that the humans can still do something that the AI cannot do when it comes to asset management? Well, I think as with anything, the AI can give you input. I mean, I think you can get input, but I don't think the AI has, like if I'm looking at somebody that's a presidency of a company and I know they have the ability to run that company. There's not all the AI in the world couldn't help me determine that. If I know they're a winner, that's not something that goes into AI. Now they're gonna say differently than that, but I disagree with them. Um, and I, I think it has its place, I really do. I think there's a lot you can do with AI, certainly, especially with uh, what people wanna do and what they wanna buy or what they, you know, what the, the different habits that they have. But when it gets down to character, and where are you going to head with a company? I don't think AI is going to help you a lot. Interesting. So you don't think AI is going to, I guess, gain emotional intelligence? I don't think so. I think you'll get, you could get portions of that maybe by watching habits, but I don't think you're going to be able to know what type of individual can make the right decision at the right time, because I don't think you can feed that into AI. You're probably right, Ted. I mean, a lot of people I know don't have emotional intelligence, forget computers. <laughs> so we're probably a long way off. I wanna move on to talk about one of your books. You've written a number of books. Um, this one is interesting, The Psychology of Staying Rich. And you know, you're writing about what to do with your, wants, with your wealth, rather, once you've obtained it. Now, is there a trend of American families losing wealth especially generational wealth that's been passed down? Is that, what prompted you to write this book is basically my question. Well, uh, let, let me say this, David. First of all, I write a number of books, many books, but they're small. And the reason we do is because we always say, look, we want you to be able to read that book on a flight from New York to Miami or Dallas to Chicago. Okay. Okay. Because most, most successful people will not take the time to read a 500 page book, 450, they won't do that, okay? And so you wanna get your point across quickly. The reason we wrote this one, one of these books is because we've worked so many years, really almost four decades with people that sell companies. So we've seen everything you can do, every what I call twist off that you can have after getting a lot of money after selling a company. And we've seen them all. And I'm telling you, I could give you so many stories that would be disappointing to you about how they get this significant wealth. I mean, wealth that will take you all the way to the deathbed and never have to worry about a thing. And all of a sudden you look up 10 years and they're broke. And so that book prompted us, this psychology of staying rich is like, 
you know, we interviewed and, you know, we have some billionaire customers too, but we also interviewed a number of billionaire customers and, you know, they give us some interesting info because they still have all their money. And, uh, but up and down the spectrum, it all goes the same. But I think the hardest part is you can make, a lot of people can make money in a company, make a lot of money, but you flip it around after they sell it. And for them to keep that wealth and keep it growing consistently, it's really harder. It's almost harder than making money in their own company. I'm, I'm going to come back to the keeping wealth part, but I just want to ask you because, you know, you've obviously interacted with and worked with a lot of very wealthy people. If you take a look across the board at all the wealthy people that you know that have made it in life in whatever profession that they may be in, what are some of the common personality traits and characteristics that they all have that have brought them there? Well, the first one that I would say with all of them is that they worked extremely hard when they had their companies. I mean, they were almost all of them, you know, were seven days a week, you know, 24 hours. I mean, these, these people worked, they started with nothing and, uh, you know, they, they had to make it if they're going to make it. And then just kept on pressing, pressing and pressing. And, you know, they, they were really good people. They had good employees. They learned how to hire good people. They learned how to make the thing work. They developed a tremendous ability to take care of the person that was buying their product or whatever it was. And they, they, they just understood the business acumen top to bottom. And that's why they grew from having a really small company to a really large company. Okay. Um, very qualitative things. Were there professions or academic backgrounds that were more consistent than others? Not really. Uh, it's interesting you asked that question. That's a really interesting, nobody's ever asked that to me, but I'll tell you, let me tell you, I have a, so many people that I have that are mega wealthy, okay? Mm -hmm. Got out of high school, they never went to college, okay? But they're smart, real smart. And they were able to do what they needed to do and follow their dream and do what they want to do. On the other hand, I have people that have, you know, they came through it with most of the degrees really that work come out of finance. You want to get right down to it because that's how they end up in a company and go one way or the other. But um, I, you know, I've always said this, and I think this is really true. Uh, it's true in my company and I've got other companies as well, but the president of the company needs to be the number one salesman. And people forget that. But if you're running a company and you want to be big, you better be able to sell. And I found that true with all of these people that really get there. They've got it together. I've been told, and this is up, up to debate, and I'll ask you, that your first job out of college, if you do choose, if you do show, uh, choose to go to college, is your most important job because that sets you up for your life, your direction. True or false? Oh, I think that's false. Yeah, okay. I think a lot of first jobs are, you know, when you come out of college, I used to say that you're sort of a head full of mush in a way because you... Okay. You don't you don't know what you want. You just know you have a degree. You're glad to get a job, uh, and all of a sudden you think you know uh, I'm not making any money. <laughs> I want to do something uh, different. And no, I I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Okay, uh, going back to your book now, the people that have lost a lot of wealth, what what did they do? I mean, it's easy to spend money, I guess. So I guess that question answers itself. So, but how did they do it? The, based on your observations. Well, you know, David, the first thing they did is they overestimated their own ability. And when I say that, most of these people have gotten a lot of money after selling a company. They really are very, very bright. Don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean you can be bright, though, and you're not good at running other businesses because you don't know those businesses. But all of a sudden, I sell my company for $100 million. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm really pretty smart. I think I could do almost any business. And so... I step out and buy, you know, three or four other businesses, which I can't operate, don't understand the business, and I just keep pouring money in, and my ego won't let me back off of them and just say that didn't work. And so they pour money in, money in, money in. At the same time, I'm over here on the personal side, you know, buying a home in St. Bart. I'm up in Vail, you know, and I've got I bought my jet. I mean, right. it all goes together and you look up and and it's and it's over. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
unlimited wants, limited resources. That is the that is perennial uh, issue for all of humanity, <laughs> uh, even for the wealthy, I guess. Uh, yeah. Finally, uh, you know, a lot of younger people who may be watching the show will want to learn from you and learn from perhaps some of the investing mistakes that you've made when you were younger and less experienced. Maybe you can share one or two anecdotes with us. You know, the number one thing I would recommend to people that are young and looking at investing is this, okay? Don't be so hung up on your own opinion that you can't make a shift. You want to be so right when you're young. You want to say, hey, I bought this. It worked. It's great. It's doing well. Or these are doing well. And and and, and if something changes and you, and you can't say, okay, I don't know what's going on, but something's changing and I need to change, okay? Most young people can't do that, okay? They're like, well, I'll wait on it to come back or I'll do this or the other. I would say to you, don't do that. And one of the things I always found that was a good thing for me at least was, and I and I stuck by this pretty well. I've, I've, on occasion, I've had it go a little further than this, but normally if I own something, and it goes down 20% on me, then I'm gonna take a really, really, really hard look at it because either I've made an error in what I'm looking at or, or the whole markets are down a whole lot and that's a different yeah. situation. But you gotta make a decision there on how far I'm willing to go with that investment before I, because we found a lot of times, your normal markets, if you lose 20%, you'll probably lose 50. And, and, and you have to get to a point in your life, investing life, to where you know when to say, you know what, I made an error. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Didn't work. I mean, I can go back and give you five, four or five Warren Buffett errors, and he'll tell you about them. But you have to be able to do that in order to really do well. I think the other thing with young people, and they need to try their best to do this, hang around people that have 30 years older than them or something like the people that have been around the investment business a long time, they'll learn a lot. You're not gonna learn much from people your same age if you're 25 years old, because they don't have the experience. But if you hang around and ask a lot of, most of my great stuff over the years came from people that were older than I was. And I'd sit down and ask them questions. How, why, is it, what do you think about this? You know, and they'd tear it apart and man, I, I learned a lot, okay? Or they'd say, yeah, you're on the right, you're looking at it correctly, but think about this. Remember the people that have gone ahead that are really, really bright, that have experience, you'll learn a lot from that. Final question, I'll let you go, Ted. This has been very enlightening. What's, speaking of learning, what's one thing that you would like to learn more now that maybe you haven't had a chance to do so yet? Oh gosh, David, that's a tough question for me because I think there's so many things I don't know. Uh, that I try to learn all the time. And, and I continue to read about this, by the way, okay? But anything that has to do with anything that's come on strong in the last five or six years, and I've always done this since I've been in business, but I'll take this right now, for example. Uh, if you look right now, I've, I've been wanting to, you know, I've been trying to learn more about AI, I've been trying to learn more about crypto, been trying to learn more, you know, about DeFi. I've been trying to learn more about black box. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to learn more about, you know, front running, all the things that are different today than they used to be, because this business changes all the time. Trading today is nothing like it was 30 or 40 years ago. It's nothing. And so I'm always trying to learn. And I watch young people that are doing something new all the time. And I learn a lot. I say, can you, can you teach me that? Or can you show me how that works? A lot of things, you know, on the internet, certain things that I, and that's, that's what I'm always trying to do because it, it, this is a learning business. And if you don't stay up with it, um, you know, it'll leave you behind. Sorry, just one, one, one note. You said that trading now is different than 30 years ago. How so? Well, the biggest thing that happened in, in trading was this. We, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you had, uh, you had the NASDAQ and you had the New York Stock Exchange, American Exchange, and we traded in quarter of a point, sometimes half a point. So that's why Wall Street did so well because they could make markets on the bid and the ask and that's how they made money. And two things changed that, okay? One, we came along and, and for some reason they decided they wanted to switch to decimals like Europe 
And when they did that, we went from a half a point or, or a quarter of a point, 25 cents to one penny. So think mm -hmm. about it. I'm a trader, okay? If I was trading 40 years ago and I bought a stock at 20 and a half and the bid was 20, I've got to get 20 and five eighths before I can make any money. Today, if I'm if I'm bidding at 20 and it's 2001, all I have to get is 2002. So all of a sudden the activity picks up big and it com becomes some computerized and computers can run that real quickly. See, that all changes that up. And the second thing really was, uh, I think when you went to no commissions, you really made it, um, what would I say, more of a game and people, uh, people can just throw it around now. They don't really have to think about what they invest in. All right, final question. Tell us about some of the products at Oxbow. Tell us your strategy for keeping up with the times and perhaps this bear market. Well, you know, we uh, we had a, we had a pretty good 22, really, because we came. We had a lot of liquidity in 22. We had over 50 percent in it in all three strategies. Um, and I thought this all along. I thought our conservative fixed income strategy, which is a short term bond strategy that's done really well over the years. It, it was down some last year, not tons, but it was down a little bit. It's probably going to be the best this year, in my opinion. I don't, I, you know, we had a, a tough 21. We made money, but a tougher 22. I think 23, that will come along. Secondly, I think in our high income strategy, which is the middle strategy that we have, there's a lot of things in there now that really look attractive. And, I'll, you know, if you look at uh, qualified dividend preferred, you look at gas pipelines, you look at uh, a number of the REITs that have gotten really cheap. All of this has happened in the last month. Uh, all of that stuff is going to get you a cash flows of anywhere from five to eight and a half percent and probably going to trade with the bond market. If, if we're right, the bond, bond market does better than people think that will do well this year because it will go with the bonds on the stock side. I think you're going to have to own companies have great balance sheets. We still have about half liquid in that account. I mean, we're 50 percent cash, but we have great companies and the companies we do have are in great shape and they're they're tracking with the market in here. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the stock market this year to have uh, these periods where you go up 10 and down 15 or up 12 and down 14. You know, those have a couple of big swings this year and people get frustrated with it. But that's how we're sort of positioned for the year. All right. Fantastic. Well, Ted, I appreciate your your thoughts and your analysis. Thank you for your contribution to the channel. Thank you for coming on today. All right, David. Thank you. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe.